All right. All right. Okay. So thank you. Um, so, so today we're talking about um, Euler's identity and phasers. We're going to wrap that up. We talked about that the other day. Um, we're going to talk about roots of a complex number and then trying to simplify some math and calculus with complex numbers. So I've put the section numbers that kind of go along with these, you know, here in the notes. I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of formulas in the book. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of formulas. One of the things that you'll find, um, you guys get too focused on sort of memorizing formulas, unfortunately, because of, of there being so many of them. The stuff isn't as hard as it looks. And I think sometimes the formulas make you, make you think that. Um, I've taken a couple of things here. Um, there's, I, I added, I sent an announcement about this the other day, but I've created some summary pages here that have some useful complex number, number formulas. Um, some useful stuff in MATLAB, as well as the Euler's identity summary. Um, so it's sort of three separate sort of summary documents, so you don't have to thumb through the book to, to try to find those, all right? Um, but I, I'm not too big on getting overly formula-driven, and I'm going to try to show you that as, a, as we go through the semester. I think there's a lot more that you can get with intuition if you develop intuition for what this stuff means, okay? All right, so let's, let's jump into it. Um, first of all, I wanted to make sure... Before I get into the meat of this, um, some stuff that we've already done before, and I've given this example before, but I, I wanted to talk real quick about, um, you know, some of the things that you can do with MATLAB and make sure you guys are comfortable with this. On an exam, I'm obviously going to want to see that you know how to manipulate complex numbers by hand, okay, that you can do things like, um, you know, convert between polar and complex and, and, that, you, and that you can do all those, those different things, polar, rectangular, complex. You can add and multiply, but as a check on yourself, again, I really recommend that you use MATLAB and I really recommend that you transition out of using your calculator as much as you possibly can. Um, because it's, you'll find that if you get more and more comfortable with MATLAB, I know it's new, right? So it's, it's but the only way you're gonna get comfortable with it is to just push yourself into using it. And you're gonna find ultimately over time that it becomes easier and easier to use, all right? And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be jogging you into this when the first project comes up, not in the not too distant future, that's when we're really going to really jump, jump into it pretty hard. But the, the key thing is it lets you check your answers pretty, pretty easily. All right. Check to see that you're doing your work right. So, you know, as an example of that, all right, let's say I've got these two numbers here. Z1 is 3e to the j45 and Z2 is 4e to the minus j90. All right. So we've looked at this before. I multiply these two guys together. All right. So, one thing that, that we've said, if I talk about the, what the angle of these is, the, the reason I like the complex notation, there's nothing for me to memorize, all right? I already know what the answer to this is, right? When I'm in complex form, I already know the answer. What is it, right? It's just, I'm multiplying Z1 times Z2. So it's just three E to the J 45 degrees times four E to the minus J 90 degrees and I'm just multiplying two numbers, right? So if I'm multiplying two numbers, that magnitude is 12. What do I do if I have, and forget that there's a complex number J or whatever in this. If I have E to the A times E to the B, what do I always have? You add A plus B. I add A plus B. So, and that makes this E to the J what? Negative 45. Negative 45. Okay, negative 45. All right, so if I wanted to do that in MATLAB, what I do is, it, this is in the example, I, I always upload my MATLAB code that I used in class, so you can go back and look at it. All right, but I've got the code here on this slide as well. So notice what I did, I've got three times exponential. So this, this is MATLAB's way of saying E, right? Exponential of argument. If I enter this, and I, I mentioned this in that summary table that I uploaded into Canvas, but in MATLAB, any, anytime I have a trig function or exponential, the angle here is always radians. All right, always radians. So notice what I did. I did a conversion but from 45 degrees to radians. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm old, so I guess I multiply by pi over 180, right? The other thing that you can do is you can use radians to degree, or in this case, degree to radians. Okay, those, those are commands that you could use. If I did degrees to radians of 45 degrees, that would equal pi over four radians. All right, 
So um, what I did was I just put it in that form, multiply those, and, and then I get an answer. And then one thing, if you want to check yourself, right, if I do abs takes the magnitude, angle gives me the angle of it, all right? I don't have to worry about whether it's in the third quadrant or the fourth quadrant or any of that sort of stuff, right? So I don't have to worry about the arc tangent stuff. I just basically do that, all right? And that's a, that's a simple way to always kind of check yourself. So, so I would get comfortable utilizing those commands because they, they, they're helpful um, to know if you're, if you're doing the right process, okay? All right, <clears throat> so let me, the chat window up there is helpful for me. Um, all right, so let's talk about a, a, another example here. So let's say I've got um, Z1 divided by Z2 and I've got them in Cartesian form like this. All right, again, I've got a MATLAB piece of code to manipulate this, but I want you guys um, to, help me, to help me do this. All right, so first of all, if, if, I see, if I see things in, if I see that I need to do division, okay? If I see that I need to do division, then what form do I wanna be in? Exponential. Exponential, right? Because then I, then I can just view them as two different numbers. And exponential and polar are really kind of the same thing, all right? So, for, so the simple question here, three plus two J, that guy's pretty easy to do the conversion of because, because he's in the first quadrant, all right? So the way that I always look at this is I, I look at this and I say, well, I want to I wanna sketch where those numbers are so I have a good sense of what to expect the answer to be. So let's say Z1 there, I got negative four plus three J. Where's that guy? What quadrant? Second. Two. Yeah, second quadrant. And he's um, a little bit longer in the X direction. So he's like that, okay? So this would be Z2. And then Z1 would be, I guess, like that, okay? All right. So I'm dividing them like that, all right? I'm gonna end up dividing them. The thing, the thing that, I, that I always think about in my mind is if I'm over here in the second quadrant or the third quadrant and I'm trying to figure out the angle of, of something, arctan doesn't work there, all right? Arctan does not work for me. And so I have to, I have to think about what the angle is gonna be, all right? So in this case, what do I, let's say I want to find the angle of Z2 here by hand. So Z2's angle, angle of Z2. How do I, how should I get that in this case? Arctan of what? Arctangent of negative four over three. Yeah, arctangent of negative four over three. All right, now that's not quite right because I'm in the second and third quadrant, all right? If I'm over there, and I, I noticed the, the formula sheet that I put together, which, which really started from one that Philip created, it, there's a, it really doesn't matter. I'm just gonna say I, I add 180 degrees to it, all right? Anytime I'm in the second or third quadrant, I'm always gonna add 180 degrees. And my answer is gonna be right. I might have a positive angle, I might have a negative angle, all right? One of the things that, I, that I've seen just from stuff in the Discord already kind of coming up from you guys is that you know, when you, when you look at these things, um, you got, I typically have you enter in MATLAB on, on Canvas. When you're entering your answer, I typically ask you to do it with your angle between minus 180 and 180. Is that is kind of standard in the industry that we talk about angles between minus 180 and 180. But remember, if I have this guy that's over in this direction right here, right? I, there's infinitely many angles that, that could represent the angle of Z2, right? I could have one angle is going this way, right? That's a positive angle. If I go this way, that would be a negative angle, right? And so those both answers are correct, all right? Um, and, and so there's, there's, and there's many others, right? I can add 360 degrees to both of these answers and I'd still be correct, okay? Hopefully you guys remember all that, all right? But that's, that's something you gotta get comfortable with. I have a question about the, the negative degrees. So is, would negative one degrees be in quadrant four? Negative one degree would be in quadrant four, right? So okay. if, if the thing to remember, anytime, 
So if I'm talking about positive angles, I'm talking about moving in the counterclockwise direction from zero, right? Zero degrees is over here. If I'm moving in the counterclockwise direction, that is when I'm talking about uh, positive angles. If I move in the clockwise direction, that's where I'm talking about negative angles. Right? So what you would say is if I move this way, this is negative 90. But if I had moved in the clockwise direction, it would have been 270. Those are two, two identical answers. Okay. All right, now, um, the thing that you have to do, my recommendation to you always, and so people ask, well, why isn't it arctan a negative four over three? One of the things is if you, if you go into the, and this, is, this to me is why it's important to think in degrees rather than radians. I have trouble thinking in, in radians about what that means. If, if you just do, if, if I sketch Z2, all right, the way I sketch Z2 here, I know Z2 is over in that quadrant. So I know that this guy better have an angle that's either between 90 and 180 or between minus 180 and minus 270, okay? He either is between 90 and 180 or minus 180 and minus 270, all right? So I wanna check that. So here's the MATLAB code that I did. So I wanted to show you guys this real quick. So my MATLAB code, notice what I did. So I did, radians to degrees because all of my trig functions in MATLAB default, all right, into um, radians, okay? So they always assume that they're going to give you an answer in radians or they have an argument in radians. So what I did here is I said arctan of the imaginary part of Z1 over the real part of Z1, right? So it took, it took that stuff right out of there for me. So there's a good example of some MATLAB code. All right, now let's look at what that answer was. So let's run that guy real quick. Um, so I'm gonna go to my example code for today. All right, so here's, here's this example. And again, I uploaded this and it's on my slide, but let's, let's just look at this here real quick. So I highlight that, evaluate the selection, and then look at what's in the window here. So this guy told me when I did that, negative 36 degrees was the answer. If I get that as the answer, I know I'm wrong, right? There's no way this guy Z2 has an angle of negative 36 degrees. That's why I'm saying sketch this thing. That'll be a good check on whether or not you've done the right formula. So if I get something like that, that tells me, well, I got to be over in the second or third quadrant. So I'm going to add 180 degrees to it. Now I get 143 degrees. That looks about right. If I measured the angle from zero, that's here, right, over to here, that looks like about 143 degrees to me. All right. You guys follow what I did there? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, if you would, let's say instead that you had subtracted 180 degrees, that's perfectly fine too, right? Let's say I had subtracted 180. In that case, I got negative 216 degrees. Well, where is that negative 216? How would I measure that? Go clockwise. Go, yeah, go clockwise. This guy would be the negative 216, all right? Both of them are, are equivalent answers. Typically in practice, we give our answers between 180 and minus 180, okay? <coughs> all right, questions there? Um, thank you. Is Z2 on the graph? Zachary, you asked a good question. I labeled them wrong here. Um, this one is Z2, and this one is Z1. Yeah, good catch. All right. All right, anything else on that? All right, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna move on. All right, so, that, so just, just some basic stuff. So I wanna talk about a little bit what we did last time. So let me go back to full screen. All right. So last time, basically what we did was we talked about Euler's identity. All right. And, and what I said, and we're talking a lot more about it today, right? Euler's identity is this idea that if I have e to the j theta, it's equal to cosine of theta plus j sine theta. All right. So um, essentially what that sort of says is if I have, and again, that's not all that surprising, right? If, if I have 
um, essentially some vector that I said, you know, e to the j 45 degrees. That's a vector that has a length of one and an angle of 45 degrees. You know that its real part should be cosine and its imaginary part should be sine. So that's really nothing all that particularly fancy, right? We seem to make it fancier maybe, maybe than it is, but it's just a statement of something that you already know. It really kind of relates the, the exponential form to the rectangular form, all right? Now, what we said last time is I said, well, what happens if I put a negative theta in for theta, right? So then essentially what I would have is if I put a negative theta in there, right, I get e to the negative j theta, right? If I say, what is, what is cosine of minus theta? What's that always equal to? If anybody remembers the trig identity, cosine of minus theta is always equal to what? Is it cosine theta? Yep. All right. It's always equal to cosine theta. All right. Now, what about sine of negative theta? Negative sine theta? Negative becomes negative sine theta. So the way I think about that is the cosine eats the negative sine and the sine spits it back out. All right. So negative J sine theta like that. All right. So what, what we did last time is if you, if you look at this expression and you tried to combine, let's say you added E to the J theta to E to the negative J theta. If you add those two together, right? E to the J theta is equal to cosine theta plus J sine theta, right? If I added those two things together, what do I get? Right? If I add those together, let's say I add both sides of those equations, what do I get? What happens to the imaginary okay. parts? So imaginary cancels out. Yeah, the imaginary cancels out and I get basically two times the cosine. So that led us to this expression right here. All right. And this is in, in section 4.4 of the book, this, this kind of key relationship. And then we, if, we, if we instead said, well, let's, let's subtract these things, all right, let's subtract them, all right, so let's subtract both sides of this equation like this. But then if I subtract both sides of this equation, what do I get if I do that? Well, on this side, the cosine terms are gonna go away, right? And what I'm gonna get is essentially two J times sine theta. So if I multiply that guy by one over two J, I'll get sine theta. That's what this expression is right here. All right, so we're gonna use those relationships. And the other thing we're gonna use is the fact that, the, that the, the cosine is always the real part of E to the J theta, and the sine is the imaginary part of E to the J theta. So notice I use these terms here, these operators, real and imaginary, to denote the real and imaginary parts of something. And you'll notice I had that in my MATLAB code, right? Notice in my MATLAB code, I had imaginary and real, all right, as, as operators that extract the real part, extract the imaginary part. And let me ask you this. If I talk about the imaginary part of something, does that include the J? Yes. It does not. All right, glad I asked it. <laughs> um, it doesn't include the J. It's the coefficient on the J is the imaginary part. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. All right. So we, we defined that stuff last time. And then basically what I did was I started drawing a bunch of different pictures. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what this, what this idea says, and, and in particular, what I, what I did was I said, well, instead of theta, we usually are talking about waves, things that move as a function of time. And I said, usually what we do is we let theta equal to omega T plus five. So as time advances, the angle is moving. All right, and I saw some questions in the Discord this morning about you know, computing different angles. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at an example to maybe help us with that a little bit here. But last time what we started to do is, is we looked at some, some videos. Well, we looked at the outputs of some videos, right? So essentially what we did here was we looked at this. I, I took an example, let's say we took four cosine 1000 T. All right, that four cosine 1000 T if, if we looked at this, I said, all right, if I had, crap, if I had E to the J 1000 T, that guy is always equal to cosine of 1000 T plus J sine 1000 T. 
like so. All right. So clearly, when I look at that picture, I see the real part of e to the j1000t has to be cosine. Okay. All right. Now, the, the other thing that I did was I used Euler's identity to write this expression right here. And then what I did, and I still have it in the notes again this time, is I basically said, well, let's let time move from t equal to zero to wherever t equals 30 degrees, to wherever t equals 60 degrees, to wherever t equals 90 degrees, to wherever t equals 270. And I basically followed this around. All right. What I'm, what I'm basically saying with this is that if I have four cosine 1000 t, I can represent it as two vectors that are half the size and rotate around the unit circle. Okay, so um, I uploaded the code that I used to generate this if you wanted to visualize it yourself, right? I uploaded it um, and it's called, so if you wanna see where I upload this stuff too, first of all, I always, I always put it here. So I made this file called Euler Demo 2020 and Dynamic Phaser Demo, all right? So we're gonna look at this one here, this Euler Demo. And just to, to see this a little bit, let me go and let me run this code here, all right? So this code, what I've, what I've put in here is four cosine 1000 T. All right, now let's watch it. What you see is I've got these two rotating vectors that are gonna move. It's gonna update slowly, right? What you have here on the real axis is the sum of those two things. And the sum of them is changing, but it's always real, right? Because one vector points up, one vector points down, so their imaginary parts always cancel, all right? And the bottom, I'm watching what their real part, the value of their real part as time advances. On the bottom, I'm watching the, the, the value of the imaginary part as time advances, all right? So what this tells me is, and again, let's, let's do that one more time. What is this, in words, what does this tell me? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Any ideas? Um, is the top one a graph of the static phaser and the bottom graph of the dynamic phaser? No. Would it, would it be the reverse? Would the top one be the dynamic phaser and the bottom would be the static? Okay, phaser? let's let's go back. What does what does dynamic mean? What does the term dynamic mean? It's changing. Changing, right? So what I'm what I'm looking at here specifically, right, is I am looking at Euler's identity. So I am basically saying I have I can think of four cosine one thousand t as the summation of two vectors like this, or I could think of it as the real part of some, of some vector, right? So what I'm, what I'm really saying with this is, is that basically, oh, where did, where did it go? Where'd it go? Let's run this guy one more time. All right. What I have is two vectors, this one and this one that are rotating over time. And the sum of those two rotating vectors is always cosine. And it's always a real thing, okay? So that, this is the thing. I have two complex vectors that are both moving as time advances, and they equal to something that is always real, all right? Something that we can have in the real world, right? I've said that radio waves and power signals and all that stuff are cosine waveforms and sine waveforms. Those are real things. If you stick your hand in a wall socket, you'll feel a sinusoidal voltage. Don't do it, but you'll feel it, right? I can think of that thing as something that has a real and imaginary part that's moving. All right, so, so you, you guys said things that um, were, were, were good, right? But I, let's, let's summarize a little bit here to see if we can kind of um, get rid of some of the confusion, right? So in general, if I have a sine wave, I think of it as having some amplitude. And typically, as you'll see a little bit more in circuits two, typically, we think of things as having a form A cosine omega t plus phi, all right? That, that expression, which is very commonly used to describe things that we have in the real world, there is no way to say it other than the fact that when you're doing analysis with A cosine omega t plus phi, 
I will put it bluntly, it's a pain in the ass to deal with the math that goes along with A cosine omega T plus phi. It has trig identities, it has integration by parts, it has all this stuff that is really, really hard to deal with. Complex numbers have much easier math. The, the idea is harder for you guys to grasp, I know, but once you grasp it, you realize that the math becomes so much easier because dealing with exponentials is a heck of a lot easier than dealing with trig functions, all right? And, and that's really part of the reason why we, we deal with this, okay? So we have two ways of thinking of this guy. The first is as the sum of two rotating complex exponentials. All right, so you can easily go through and you can, you can go back to the, you can, so I have it in the notes from last time, cosine theta equals e to the j theta over two plus e to the minus j theta over two. Right, so if, if you plug in theta equals omega t plus phi, you should easily get to the expression that's written here. All right, what this, what this says is that this guy is the sum of two rotating complex exponentials. One moving forward, meaning in the counterclockwise direction, and one moving backwards, meaning in the clockwise direction, okay? So that's, that's what I'm looking at in, in this picture right here. So let's run this guy one more time, right? So, this is the one rotating in the positive direction. This is the one rotating in the negative direction. This here on the real axis is their sum, okay? And then in the bottom picture here, what I'm showing is the, the real and imaginary part of the sum, right? There is no imaginary part to the sum, but the real part is basically tracing out cosine, all right? So to me, it helps to visualize that, that mathematical expression, right? This expression looks, looks crazy, right, at some level, right? A cosine omega t plus phi equals this whole thing. But what all it really says is I can think of cosine as two vectors that rotate, one going in the, in the clockwise direction, or sorry, counterclockwise direction, the other one going in the, in the clockwise direction. Their summation is always purely real, and it traces out cosine as time advances, all right? That's one way to view this. And we're gonna utilize that in, in a lot of problems, in ECE problems, okay? We're gonna use that a lot. The other is, is this method called phasers, all right? And, and basically what, what that is, is basically that I have um, A cosine omega T plus phi. So in other words, A cosine of theta is equal to the real part of A e to the j theta, where theta equals omega t plus phi, all right? So I just, I basically gives me, gives me two things that I see here, all right? The whole thing in here is what I call the dynamic phaser. That guy moves as time advances because I have a t in it, all right? A e to the j phi is fixed. He doesn't move, all right? That's the static phaser or sometimes just called the phaser. All right, as you're gonna see very soon in circuits two, right? Once you get into sinusoidal stuff in circuits two, which is most of circuits two, what you're gonna find is that this expression, all right, is very, very useful for being able to analyze circuits. All right, when I have problems with sine waves in them, I don't have to include time. All right, and that's one thing that you're gonna see and that makes the math a heck of a lot simpler. All right, <clears throat> if I used this thing, all right, for all of the problems that we have in ECE, I would have to use differential equations all the time. I'd have to use integration by parts all the time. I'd have to use trig identities all the time. And, and you guys might hate the math that we're already doing, but you'd really hate the math if you had to do those three things with that expression, okay? All right, so let's, so I wanna look at this guy too. So I uploaded another MATLAB thing so you could, you could try to look at that one. So there's this thing here that I called dynamic phaser demo. So you can run that as well. And I have that here. So let me do this dynamic phaser demo. So in this case, what I'm, what I'm doing it for is, let me, Go through, and I, I, I mean, I included screenshots from that guy here, so we, you can, if you follow it, you can kind of trace out what's going on. Um, well, let's let's look at, um, so let's look at, so this example here, four cosine, 
1000 T plus 30 degrees. All right, I can view that as the sum of, of two vectors rotating, okay? One in the clockwise, one in the counterclockwise. Or what I can do is, is I can say, let's look at the dynamic phaser, all right? This, and, and let's look at the static phaser. So what I have here is I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw that. So the dynamic phaser, if I have four cosine 1000 T plus 30, first of all, that has to be the real part of what? Let me ask you guys that. What's that the real part of? How should I write that? E to the J 1000 T. All right, four, E to the J 1000 T times what? Uh, e to the J 30. Yep. And so usually I write the E to the J 30 out in front. So this guy now is my static phaser. There's no time dependence there. And then there's this E to the J 1000 T that multiplies it. Okay. This guy I call static because he doesn't move. Now I can draw that in the, in the complex plane. Where is four E to the J 30 degrees in the complex plane? Where would I draw that? For e to the j 30 degrees. Uh, that for e to the j 30 degrees would be a, a vector four in magnitude at 30 degrees on the complex plane. Yep, it would be at 30 degrees. So it'd be in the first quadrant, right? So four means that's his length. 30 degrees means that's where his, his position is. So he's this is him here, right? This the one that I've shown here is 30 degrees. Now I've specifically what I, what I'm gonna what I show is, and I'm, let me go to the MATLAB thing here. All right, so I'm gonna run this for this particular guy. So if we watch it, there's the dynamic phaser moving as time advances. The static phaser is basically staying fixed. He doesn't move. The dynamic phaser keeps moving. And the other thing that I'm showing is the real part of that guy. The real part of him is always here on the real axis. So as that moves, notice what's happening down here is I'm tracing out a cosine function, okay? And this doesn't look like a pure cosine function because what I have is something that has a cosine function with a 30 degree shift. All right, so let's watch that one more time. All right, so notice the Static phaser doesn't move. The dynamic phaser keeps moving. The, the size of the real part of the dynamic phaser keeps changing. He got bigger and now he's gonna get smaller and smaller. So notice that it's his real part. So now his real part zero. Now it's gonna get bigger again, bigger again, bigger again. And there, now we're back to the beginning of a period. Okay, all right. There's a lot going on there, right? The concept's actually not that hard, but I know it's an unusual concept for you, all right? Um, any questions there? Or maybe there's a lot of questions. Uh, could you explain how you got that uh, equation on the top right? This one over here? Uh, yeah, so that's the real part of the graph, right? So this is the real part, right? So what I'm plotting is the, the, this guy right here with the argument of, the, of this thing. So four e to the j 30 degrees times e to the j 1000 t. That's the thing that rotates, it moves. As time advances, that guy moves, okay? The four e to the j 30, he never moves. He stays constant because there's no time dependence in that term. The, the four cosine 1000 T plus 30 is the real part of this thing that is moving around. So, so four E to the J 30 times E to the J 1000 T is always a complex number. Four cosine 1000 T plus 30 is its real part. So if I wanted to understand this, what I'd have to do is I'd have to take four E to the J 30 times E to the J 1000 T and expand that. Use Euler's identity to expand that. And I would see that the real part of that thing I expand is equal to this. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And the purpose for that is just because we don't have, want to have to deal with the trig function? The purpose of that is that you don't want to deal with the trig function, which I appreciate your skepticism of, if you're skeptical of it, right? Um, 
what you'll find as we as we go so it, we, and we'll look at this a little bit ourselves but you'll see it also in circuits two for instance if i it, like i said a very common thing is i have you know coming out of my wall socket i have a 60 hertz sinusoidal voltage if i have a load that has inductors and capacitors and resistors that means i got to do a differential equation if you remember doing differential equations with sinusoidal stuff the math is very complicated it becomes a heck of a lot easier with exponentials as we'll see all right and 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 that makes that ultimately what that does let's say in circuit analysis is it allows us to get rid of differential equations and basically do the same sort of thing you did in circuits one with just algebra and that's so it turns the differential equations into algebra again that's that's the really big advantage that it has um how would you find the uh the magnitude part the changes over time you, you know what i'm talking about the one that stays on the x-axis and that um the, the changing magnitude yeah so so the so remember this the dynamic phaser here has a magnitude that's constant the magnitude of this doesn't change right mm -hmm. this guy has yeah. always got a magnitude of four but but the four times so remember the part that stays on the real axis here is four cosine 1000 t plus 30. so that guy's getting smaller as time advances right cosine gets smaller and then he gets negative right so that's that's why the real part's changing because the real part's tracing out a cosine function the magnitude of of this dynamic phaser doesn't change the dynamic phaser rotates it always has the same size and as he as he rotates his angle is changing and so the magnitude of his real part is changing but, but, the, but the actual magnitude of that vector is not changing. The magnitude of the real part's changing because it's tracing out a cosine function. Understand. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, you know, there's a lot of questions about this stuff on the, on the homework and, you know, really trying to get you, you know, to understand it through the homework. Um, you know, so, you know, look, dig into that stuff, ask questions on, on Discord and, and come to office hours and, and we can deal with it. I said at the beginning today, I'd stick around for another 30 minutes if people have questions after class today, um, if you guys want to dive into any of those particular questions. All right. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to a, another thing that we can do with complex numbers isn't as important as everything we did. We're, and we're doing this basically just to um, brush up and, and get our skills a little bit better with complex numbers. Let's say I got this and I want to solve this equation. All right. Not necessarily the most useful thing in the world, but it's going to help us brush up on our skills. Let's say I have X to the fourth minus one. So first of all, how many roots does that equation have? Four. Four. All right. Now, what are they? That's hard to answer because I know that X to the four equals one. I can rearrange that. So what are the four roots? Well, one and negative one off the top of my head. <laughs> it's a tricky question. All right. You know that one is one of them, right? And it just seems like, well, maybe all four of them are one, right? Well, actually, I can, I can answer that question if I think about what is one. So first of all, wh where would I draw one on the complex plane? Where is that number one on the complex plane? It'd be entirely on the real. Entirely the on the real. Yep, entirely on the real. So he's going to basically be this direction. So sometimes I'll think about that as E to the J, zero degrees. One has an angle. Okay, one has an angle. So, but that's, e to the, to call that guy one or e to the j zero is, is correct. I could also think of that as what other, what other complex number could I write one as? One has a magnitude of one and an angle of zero. What other angle does it have? Negative zero? Wouldn't it be uh, or 360. 180? 360, not 180, right? Where's where would 180 be? That's negative one, right? That'd be negative one. That'd be pointing okay. the other. Okay. Right. So that's e to the j 360. I could also say it's e to the negative j 360, right? But that points the same way. I could also say that it's e to the j 720, couldn't I? 
right? So, so all of those things are kind of equal to each other. So that actually gives me a way to be able to handle this, this problem, all right? So more generally, let's say I've got uh, x to the n equals one. And let's see, how did, I, how did I set this guy up? All right, x to the n equals one, all right? So um, here's my real and imaginary axis, okay? So one is here. And I know that one can be equal to something that has an angle of zero and 360 degrees and 720 degrees and 720 plus 360, right? So, uh, so what's that, 1080, right? I could keep going. I'm gonna go into radians here for a second. So 360 degrees is how many radians? Two pi. Two pi. So let me say it this way. Let me say that I can write this guy as e to the j 2 pi n, where n is some number that goes from 0 to 1 and keeps going. And technically, I could have negative numbers to it as well. All right. But that, that basically means I can represent the number 1 as multiple, many different numbers. All right. Weird concept. Um, but it, it helps us a little bit in, in certain, certain cases, right? So let's say I wanted to figure out what the roots are, right? Well, so I could say that one of the roots would be one, right? Because if, if I took the nth root of, of a number, right, I'll get, I'll get one. What else could, how else could I write this? What would be another way to do this? Couldn't I say that x is equal to e to the j 2 pi n to the 1 over n power, like that? All right, so in other words, let's, let's plug in numbers. This guy here would be for n equal to 0, right? For n equal to 0, I have 1 to the n is always equal to 1, right? or, or 1 over n, okay? Let's plug in n equal to one, right? If I plug in n equal to one into this, ex into this expression here, right? What do I get? E to the two pi n? Yep, e to the j, well. J two pi n, sorry. Two, two pi over big N, like that. And then if I plug in n equal two, I get e to the j two wow. pi or sorry, I guess in this case, it's four pi, right? Four pi over n. And I can keep doing this until I got enough roots, which will be at e to the j, in this case, n minus one pi, or two n minus one pi. Sorry. J, n minus one pi, two pi. over n for n equal to n minus one. All right, so let's, let's so that's summarized here, but let's, let's look at an example. Let's say I got x to the fourth equals one. All right, like this. All right, so first of all, if that means, if, I, if it's x to the fourth, that means that I got three roots, okay? And so I, I view this, I view one as basically being a vector here that could, could be, Right. This is saying that the number one is equal to something with an angle of zero, something with an angle of two pi, right, or 360 degrees, something with four pi, and something with six pi. All of those are equivalent vectors, and all of them are basically right here. Okay. So if I wanted to to solve this this particular problem, right? and I wanted to say what the, what the roots are, basically what I would do is I would say X is four different values. So what would the four different values be in this case? What's the value for N equal to zero? One. One, yeah. What is it for N equal to one? Would it be J? Not J. Well, okay, actually you're right. It would be E to, e to the J. So e to the j what? 
Okay. What would be the, right? Remember what I'm doing here. I'm saying X equals, basically I'm raising both sides to the power one over N. So if I, so if I raise E oh, to the J. E to the J to the two pi. Yep, E to the J two pi N times one over N. I just applied the same things I, I, I know about exponentials already, right? If I, if I multiply, if I take both sides and raise both sides to the power one over N, all I do is just approach this like it's an exponential. So, so for N equal to one, I would have E to the J two pi over four, all right? What would I have for N equal to two? E to the what? Well, wouldn't it just be e to the negative j? No. e to the j 4 pi? Yep, it would be e to the j 4 pi divided by 4. And what would I have for n equal to 3? It'd be e to the j 6 pi over 4. e to the j 6 pi over 4. All right, now I can simplify all of those things, right, a little bit. But where do all of those vectors lie, right? So here's one, right? That's, for, that's my n equal to zero result. e to the j 2 pi over 4, e to the j pi over 2. Where is that vector? So it's pi over 2 radians as its angle and a length of 1. So where would that be? It would be entirely on the imaginary in the yep. positive direction. On, uh, yep, entirely on the imaginary axis like that, right? This is for n equal to 1. Where's the n equal to 2 result? <coughs> it's at pi. Where's pi radians? All right the way to the left. All the way to the left. Yep. And then I got my third one is here. Like that. All right. So basically what I found is I found the four roots of one. Now, again, this isn't, it, to be perfectly honest with you, this is not the most useful thing in an ECE context, but it's, it's a good, useful way for us to just keep using complex numbers and to get used to the operations that we can do with complex numbers, right? And that's, and that's why we're kind of going through it. All right, now one thing I wanted to show you, and again, I uploaded the code for this, um, and this is, this is in problem, I don't know, um, problem five, problem six in, in the homework, maybe, maybe problem six. So I found a, so there's a simple way to do this. So notice what I did was I defined a complex number one, I said I wanted to take the fourth root. So I set big N equal to four. And then I created this X vector. And in that X vector, I, I made it equal to nothing to start with. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to load that vector up with the four roots. So what I did, this is a perfect use of a for loop, right? Because what I want to do is I want to calculate four values. So what I did was I let N equal to zero and I incremented N from zero up to N minus one. Okay, and what I did here is I basically just put in the, the equation that I was using on the previous slide, right? So in the previous slide, this equation right here, x equals e to the j two pi little n over big N, I just have written out right here, okay? And then my output x is gonna be a vector, and that vector is gonna contain the four roots. And so one of the things I ask you to do, and I point to an example in the book, but here's an example right now that'll do exactly what, what the book shows you, which is basically I have um, figure one here using the, what's called the compass function. And, and what it's done is it's plotted the roots for me, right? This is the root for n equal to zero, n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to three. All right, you guys follow that? Um, my only question about the MATLAB part is the n plus one. Can you explain how that factors in? Well, so if you think about it, right, when n equal to zero at the, at, so at the very first run through, the, if you're not sure how a for loop works, basically have, run through the for loop without a semicolon here and watch its outputs, right? So for n equal to zero, if you think about it, I have to say, I can't, in MATLAB, there is no zeroth entry to a vector. Right, so I basically have, I'm saying the first entry, zero plus one, has an n equal to zero over here. All right, so I basically did this because the indexing in MATLAB doesn't start at zero. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Right. Yeah, 
And you guys can, can, can look over that example a little bit more, but that's, that's a helpful one. All right, now in general, let's say I had, um, you know, I don't know, some other vector, right? That's off in, let's say this direction, like that, okay? So this guy has some angle and, you know, so let's say in this case, this guy has, what did I use for my ultimate example? 45 degrees, all right? So let's say this guy has 45 degrees as his angle, right? That means the equivalent angle is also 45 plus what? 360. 360. Plus 360. Plus 360, right? There's many, many guys that have the same angle as that, right? So I can, I can use that here to say in general, if I wanted to figure out the roots. So and let me actually, before I figure out the roots, let's do it this way. This guy is equivalent to a number with the, with the same magnitude A. And I can write his angle as angle A plus if I do it in radians, how should I write that here? Not plus 360, but plus pi. what? 2 pi. 2 pi. And I, do, I multiply by a little n there, right? So n can go from 0 to 1 to 2, so on and so forth. And it could be negative 2, but we, we usually just deal with the, the positives here. All right. So that basically means that the roots x are going to be the magnitude to the one over n power times, again, I just uh, basically multiply both sides to the one over n, right? Which means take this guy to the one over n. I'm gonna move the chat window, go away. Both sides to the one over n power, like that. And I gotta move the chat window up. So that turns this into e to the j, and I get angle A plus two pi N over capital N like that, all right? And then I can run through and I can do the same sort of thing, all right? So there's, there's the final result um, sort of summarized. So let's say I have this guy, right? X cubed plus this result equals E to the J 45. So I rearrange that, I say X cubed equals negative four E to the J 45 degrees. Okay, I'm gonna rewrite that first. I'm gonna call that guy four, what angle does he have? Not negative, not 45, but what's, what's his angle? Let me take a stab at that. Uh, I'm four. Nope. 3315. It would be. Not 225. 225 degrees, all right. Reason for that, you guys can think about it. Minus one has an angle of 180 degrees, right? So I write that as one complex number. And so then if I want to figure out the three roots of this guy, the way, what they would be is x equal to four to the one third power times e to the j 225 degrees divided by four, all right? Then there would be one that would be four to the one third times e to the j. And I should be careful. I'm going to, I'm going to do this in, in terms of radians here. So 225 times pi over 180, right? That converts it into radians plus two pi like that. And then what, how much do I add to the last one here? How many radians do I add to the last one? Another two pi? Another two pi. So it'd be, so 225 times pi over 180 plus four pi. All right. And this would be for n equal to zero, n equal to one, and this would be for n equal to two. Okay. And, and here it is, here it is summarized again. All right. And so Notice uh, a couple of things. So you, you, you can go through and you can follow um, my code here that I wrote. And again, it's, it's in a direct MATLAB file that I uploaded for today. And you can, you can look at it. One important thing for you to check, if you've done these problems right, what do you notice about these vectors? Well, they basically, the, they split the circle evenly. In other words, the angles between them are all the same. All right. That's, that's one thing to, to bear in mind. All right. <coughs> so you can look at that code. 
I did the same, same thing, right? Basically what I did was I just plugged in this equation and I let n be a variable. All right, hopefully you can begin to see why MATLAB becomes a little bit easier for you. If you're doing this in your calculator, you just gotta keep you know, re-entering it and re-entering it. And if something goes wrong, you gotta re-enter it and re-enter it and re-enter it again. Whereas with this, you can, all, you can do it all in one shot. So I'm trying to get you more and more comfortable with that, that approach because it is ultimately a little bit easier, okay? Now, <clears throat> these problems aren't that hard, but again, it's gonna take you probably a little bit of time to get used to them. And there's, there's uh, one or two problems on the homework that, that deal with um, this question. Oh, lights went off on me. All right, now, the other thing I wanna talk about, we'll, we'll cover this a little bit more probably at the beginning on Thursday too, but it's, it's talked about in section 4.8. I can use Euler's identity to simplify math, all right? And we've talked about this a little bit. Let's say I gave you this integral, e to the 3x times cosine 5x. That's actually a relatively common problem as we'll see when we do analysis um, later on, all right? This, this problem's not uncommon. If I asked you to do that integral, what's the approach that you would have to take to do that integral? Integration by parts, usually. But when we turn into like a, use Euler's method, turn into like a exponential or something? Yeah. Like the cosine? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, integration by parts is the way you learn to do it. And that's, that's a tedious process, right? Because if with this, you should know, you have to do integration by parts twice, actually, right? It's gonna turn into an e to the 3x times a sine of 5x or something like that, right? So what I can do instead is I can say that um, e to the 3x, ah, e to the 3x times cosine 5x, that looks like it should be the real part of something, doesn't it? Anytime I have cosine like this, let's, let's say, doesn't it look like it should be the real part of e to the x times e to the j 5x? All right, how did I come up with that? e to the j 5x is what? What's that equal to? Uh, cosine 5x plus j sine 5x. Yep. Plus j sine 5x. And if I multiplied that whole expression, right, let's multiply both sides by e to the j, or sorry, e to the 3x. e to the 3x, there's nothing imaginary about that guy. Right? There's nothing imaginary about it. Right? the real part of both sides of this expression. So if I take the real part of the left side here and the real part of the right side, the real part of the right side is this, okay? So that, that sort of says that I can think of this integral as the real part of e to the three plus j five x dx, all right? Now, that may or may not be easier from, from your perspective, but if I look at, if I have, I mean, I think that's a lot easier. If I have e to the ax, all right? If, there's lots of integrals in the world. If there's any integral that I would remember, it would be that one because that one's really important. e to the ax dx, what is that equal to? Wouldn't it just be a times e to the ax? You had a 50-50 shot and you, and you missed it. Oops. Is it one, one over, over a? One over, one over a. a, I'm sorry. Yep. You, you remembered the derivative there, all right? Sorry. You're good, all right? That's a really important one to remember. That tells me that this guy is the real part of one over three plus j5 times e to the j, oh, sorry, e to the three plus j five <clears throat> x plus a constant, I guess. All right, the real part of whatever that is. Now you look at that and you probably say, why the hell does he think that's any easier? All right, integration by parts, <clears throat> if you really do integration by parts and don't have the internet or your calculator do it for you, right, it, it is a pain, All right? So the question then is, what do I have to do? That, this is not the answer to that problem. No one likes complex numbers as the answer to the problem. So what do I gotta do to solve that problem? All right, so there's, there's what it is. What do I do to, to solve this guy now? What do I have to do?
What's the process of finishing this thing? Solve receipt. Nope. Converted bag. Yep, gotta get the real part of both sides, right? So I get the real part of each of these. All right, and so how do I do that? How do I get the real part? So I gotta get, I have to get the real part of one over three plus J five times E to the, E to the, I'm gonna write it this way, three X times E to the J five X, like that. All right, so how should I, how should I approach that problem? Would that just be converting it back into a rectangular form to get the real part? Yeah, I could, I could do that. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it, right? So I could say the real part of one over three plus J five, right? Times, I'm going to, I'm going to write my E to the three X here. So to start that process of getting back into rectangular, I'm going to call this guy cosine five X plus J sine five X like that. All right. You guys follow that? Now to get, to get back to what the, what the real part is, right? So what I, what do I have to do? Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of ways to, to approach this, right? So if I have, I have one number in rectangular form divided by a number, another number in rectangular form, okay? So if I have that problem, you guys probably know how to do it, right? Or some of you guys do at least, how? How would I do that? Multiply by the conjugate. Multiply top and bottom by the conjugate, right? So in other words, multiply top and bottom by three minus J five, right? And that gets rid of it. I don't like that approach personally because I'm dealing, I don't like, I don't like the rectangular form when I'm doing division, right? So what I, what I like to do is actually this, right? So notice, notice what I did with it, right? So what I did was I said, all right, I have one plus three or one over three plus J five, right? If I take the magnitude of that as a complex number, I get the magnitude as one over square root of 34 like that. All right, um, and then what do I do? I got to get an angle for that thing. So notice my angle e to the negative j arctan of five over three, negative because it was on the bottom. And then I multiply that by e to the j three plus j five times x. The real part of that to me is a very obvious thing, right? Because the real part of that is when I look at that, I just got to take the real part I know that this is just e to the j theta, right? It's some number, one over square root of 34 times e to the j theta times an e to the x, or sorry, e to the three x. You look at that, take the real part of that, to me that becomes a much simpler way of looking at that problem, okay? All right, you guys, you guys have some, some work to do to, to understand this stuff, and that's what's in the homework this week, all right? Um, and we can, you know, look at, look at some more examples on, on Thursday and, and then office hours tomorrow night. And I'll stick around a little bit after class today to, to answer some questions about that. It's not that hard, but it takes you a little while to get, to get used to it. Now, what about something like this? Let's say I've got a sine times a cosine. There's a trig identity you could look up to do this, right? But how could I use Euler's identity to maybe try to simplify this thing? What if I tried this? We said before, we said that cosine of theta is always equal to one half e to the j theta plus one half e to the minus j theta. And we had a similar expression for sine, right? What was the difference with the sine expression? What's different about that one? One half over two j and then minus Yep, one over, one over a 2j and a, and a minus sign on, on this guy, right? So that means that um, this guy is equal to one over 2j times e to the j 3x 
minus e to the minus j 3x, okay? That's the sine function. The cosine function would be one half times e to the j 4x plus e to the minus j 4x, like that, <clears throat> all right? So if I simplify that a little bit, I got one over 4j, all right? So in other words, the one half, I'm moving out to the front. And then what I have is e to the j 3x minus e to the minus j 3x times e to the j 4x plus e to the minus j 4x. So how would I simplify that thing? How would I simplify that? I guarantee I can simplify it. How? Can you, can you like foil it and yep. just add the, okay. Yep. Totally. I can totally foil that. So that means if I, if I take e to the j 3x, I'm going to multiply it by this term and by this term, right? So what's, what's that give me? That gives me, what, what are the two results from doing that multiplication? Wouldn't it be e to the j 7x and then, yep. uh, negative uh, e to the negative jx e to the negative jx all right and then i'm going to do foiling again with these two and these two all right so tell me what's that result going to be negative e to the jx all right negative e to the jx and then what else am i going to get negative e to the minus j 7x. Wouldn't the second to last one be positive jx? Um, nope. Yes. No, right, because I've got a minus here, right? So minus e to the minus j 3x times e to the j 4x. Oh, oh, you're saying up top. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, that you're right about. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then the the last term right is is e to the negative j 7x if i if i look at that and combine it right you guys will ultimately see that i get one over four j i'm wrapping this up here i know it's 215 e to the j 7x plus e or sorry minus i group terms minus e to the minus j 7x plus one over four j times actually minus all right minus e to the j x minus e to the minus j x now i grouped the terms that way on purpose why what do i notice about this first grouping right here what's that have to be equal to cosine of uh close sine not cosine sine uh, yeah and it's one half sine of seven X. And it's one half because I have a, a, the, these terms are always one half of whatever this, this guy is. And then I'm gonna see that the other one is minus one half uh, of sine of X, like that, okay? All right, and then you can, you can look at that more slowly and I think I've got the I've got the final result there in, in the notes, but I, I can, I will post this with, with my math so you can look at it um, later. All right. So I'm going to end there. Um, as I said, I will stick around here for another 30 minutes or so. If you guys have questions, I am going to stop the recording. Um, but